Hello, everyone. A good day to all of you, depending upon which part of the world you reside in. I'm Shakti Saran, a former corporate sector professional and now founder of a think tank called Shaktify. Shaktify has been set up with the aim of powering social and environmental change. My inquiry into health and well-being started, you know, when I discovered a book on uh, my father's bookshelf, a book which is called Peace, Love and Healing. It was gifted to him by a friend of his and authored by noted oncologist and surgeon Dr. Bernie Siegel. And Dr. Bernie Siegel is an establishment doctor and has authored several books on the integration of, you know, the formal medical practice with the informal world of healing and, and well-being. And this book was published, you know, over 30 years and at a time when it was taboo, you know, in the world of formal medicine to deal with anything outside its boundaries. Our topic today is on holistic health and healthcare, and it is an approach to wellness that simultaneously addresses the physical, the mental, the emotional, the social, the spiritual components of health. Holistic health is sourced from multiple disciplines, from multiple cultures, and even our environment. And it should not be confused with alternative medicine. Today, I'm glad to present to you a panel of three highly accomplished uh, individuals. Vandana Gupta is the founder and chairperson of WeCare Foundation, a support group for cancer patients. Uh, she is a lymphoma survivor, and Vandana's battle with cancer has been more than exemplary. Uh, she's also extensively involved in the cancer care and the healthcare ecosystem. Uh, Dr. Marcus Rane, a qualified medical practitioner, transitioned as a healthcare entrepreneur, and his interests lie in longevity, in digital health, extreme physiology, planetary health, epidemiology, and volunteering. Marcus is also a regular public health commentator. Dr. Taranjit Kaur is a consultant, oral, and maxillofacial surgeon, and she is also a former professor of surgery, and her work dwells on chronic pain disorders and the early detection and prevention of oral cancers. Her interests lie in medical philosophy, gender equality, patient safety, and the body-mind connection. Thank you, Vandana, Marcus, and Taranjit for accepting my request to be here today. Your backgrounds are not only diverse, but in aggregate, you cover the entire spectrum of health and wellness. Today, we have a large landscape to cover. Yeah, we will, you know, during the course of the webinar, evaluate the role of the biomedical model in the treatment of illness. Uh, we will go over the paradigm of well-being and also uncover what holistic health and healthcare is. After our question conversation, we will have about 20 minutes for audience question and answers. If you would like to pose a question to the panelists, make sure to enter it in the Q&A box and not in the general chat because questions inserted in the general chat will not get answered and make sure to specify to whom the question is directed to. So I'm going to start with, you know, the personal journeys of uh, each of our panelists and try and get a snippet, something interesting about their personal journey, uh, which is, you know, along the lines of what really motivates them. And Vandana, let me start with you. You know, you've been a cancer survivor and you know, what did that bout of cancer mean to you? And how did you navigate your way out of it? Uh, good evening to everybody. And uh, thank you, Shakti, for, for having us on this uh, panel. What I, you know, when I had cancer, it meant cancer is equal to death. Nothing more than that. I mean, today I may say of, uh, you know, like lofty things because I've got over it and I've done things. But at that time, I was equally scared and I was like, you know, sure that it's only a matter of time when I will not be living anymore. And then, uh, you know, I found a purpose in life in the sense I was watching a television show and uh, I saw many cancer survivors sitting there and talking and sharing their stories. And that gave me a purpose in my life. And I thought, you know, uh, why not do something after my cancer is over? which means that I connected the purpose to my health and I thought that I should be able to do something, you know? So that gave me a high and it had a profound effect on my health because then I knew that I, I had to get well soon to do, be able to do something. 
So I think we need to have like a purpose in our life to be able to do something more. And that's how the whole thing came about. And uh, that's how we care was born subsequently. So I, uh, you know, I'm very grateful to the people who helped me find the purpose through which I was able to do this today. All right, excellent. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Vandana, for sharing uh, this aspect of your journey and this whole thing about purpose. It is so crucial. It's what really gets us going. Uh, Marcus, I'm going to turn to you. You know, you qualified as a medical practitioner. You also served in practice for two years and then decided to move. You know, you decided to dedicate your life to health and well-being outside the realm of practice. So what made you give up practice and look at the larger health canvas? Stopped active hospital work and, and sort of seeing patients on the wards, but I continue to see incredible human beings who are operating at extreme limits of human physiology, either IPL cricketers or Olympic sportsmen. And then of course, a lot of work in the corporate sector as well. And I think for me, the dots got connected, Shakti, because before um, graduating as a physician, uh, the early stage of my career, which was my first degree, actually, which was in human physiology, I spent serving in the Royal Air Force. And that's where I sort of fell in love with this idea of pushing the limits of our biology and what we can learn at that extreme envelope and then translate it to our back day to day lives. And therefore, practicing in the traditional clinical setting became a little bit disenfranchising to me because I'm a big believer of, of this idea of medicine 3.0, which is we've moved from curation to prevention, and now we need to take it from prevention to optimization. And what can we do to optimize ourselves physiologically, psychologically, whether it's at work, at home, and at play. So that's how I spend my time now, Shakti. All right, okay, excellent. Thank you, thank you, Marcus. Uh, Taranjit, uh, your turn now. You know, you, you spent over 20 years in uh, in teaching yeah you were a teacher lecturer professor and you switched to practice quite recently so what made me more motivated you to do that you're on mute uh, taranji like in case of vandana uh, ji it was her lymphoma which uh, gave a new purpose to her life in COVID, when we saw, when we served so many patients and we saw how, um, you know, they were dying, that's when we realized that we could be one of them. And that also gave me a realization that now I want to save my energy before I've totally lost it um, to something that I would like to do at a deeper level. I want to convert the quantity into quality and, you know, stick to less quantity, but uh, give quality to that time to my family, the work-life balance, which was missing in my life at that moment. I've tried to, as Marcus used the word, optimize. I think optimization is the word for 21st century and onwards. I think that's where we all have to strive towards to be. Uh, so that's how I took a sabbatical, so-called sabbatical, from academics, full-time academics. I would like to go back to academics because it's my passion, but that's not going to be full-time anymore. It will be part-time. And I would like to give more time to my other aspects, facets of my personality. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Taranjit, for bringing this out and sharing this with us. So I'm going to move on to what is the first theme of uh, you know this webinar, which is understanding illness and uh, and evaluating the role of the biomedical model in the treatment of illness. So when we speak about the biomedical model, we should just be clear, what is it that we're referring to? We're referring to the conventional allopathic system of Western medicine, uh, which dwells on understanding mechanisms of uh, you know, biological malfunctioning. And then it uh, expresses itself in interventions to combat symptoms and com uh, to combat what is not working right biologically. And this really includes, covers the whole gamut of, uh, you know, from computer assisted diagnostics to pharmacology to vaccines. And we saw that in COVID, uh, you know, minimally invasive surgeries, you know, all of that. So my set of questions now I've got to do with, uh, you know, with this theme. And, uh, you know, Vandana, I'm going to, uh, you know, sort of start with you again. 
Uh, and you've already shared your your journey with us and you know the fact that cancer helped you discover purpose uh, but can you just dwell on this for another minute and and tell us do you feel like you were treated for cancer or you were cured from cancer or do you feel like you've been healed what is your current disposition like so i would like to first start with saying that uh... We keep, keep talking about going to a doctor and getting cured over there, and that is our head. But I think the doctor can only give you medicines, and that's all. That's it. That means the scientific part you can deal with, but the rest of the health is in your hand. And you have to do it yourself by finding how to, uh, like I said, the purpose in living. And your thoughts, your beliefs, your feelings, the joy, the anger, and the sadness. Everything is a signal that can change your gene expressions. I think every time you go through these emotions, there are a lot of things that change inside you and that is very important. So I think we have to nourish ourselves with fresh food, move your body every day, rest, sleep, connect with others and find a purpose and meaning in your life. And you, know, you need to feel all the feelings and mind your thoughts and you know, I may be becoming philosophical about the whole thing, but uh, today, after all these years, it's almost 30 years that I've finished my treatment, that I can think of these things. You know, maybe at that time, I was very, very scared, very conventional, and I thought the doctor is the only person. But with my experience, I would like to share this with others, that it's yourself, your thoughts that you have to work with to get yourself cured. And, and Vandana, uh, just staying on this topic, is there a positive side to illness? What would be your message to the people on to the audience here today? Did your illness contribute to a betterment of your life uh, in ways that you might not have achieved without cancer? Uh, definitely, because, you know, um, when, uh, when I had cancer, I was like a true housewife working uh, everything and doing everything in the house and that was my uh, you know like a domain that I was the queen in that domain that I could do and handle everything and you know like uh, Taranjit and I were talking multitasking and I was happy about it it wasn't like I was sad but maybe you know inside me I always had a desire to do something for others which was not being done uh, in a more uh, like in a bigger circle Maybe that's why I was looking after the family very well. But then there were other things that had to be taken care of, which were not being done. So because of my illness, you know, I got this thing that uh, I can look after the family. At the same time, I can do more things. So I remember my father telling me that, you know, you can go and do whatever you want to do, provided you don't neglect the family. Because if you neglect the family, whatever you do for others is meaningless. So, with, you know, I found a balance between that and I was able to do what uh, I really wanted to do without upsetting any Apple guys. All right. Hats off to you for striking that balance. It is uh, something which is so crucial. Uh, Marcus, you know, you're, you've spoken about uh, the reason why you, you, you sort of departed from formal practice of medicine. But your education, your medical education is still rooted in the biomedical model. And, uh, you know, you, you have been, you know, you've been uh, uh, doing a fair amount of medical work. I'm sure you've been capitalizing on that education. But tell us today, what in your experience are the advantages and limitations of the biomedical model? I think the advantages are that there is an empirical nature of science which has percolated across to create advancements. Um, you know, going back in history through time, uh, our forefathers as ancestors who used to treat medicine and the clinical practice of it would talk about the humors and, you know, not really understanding what was happening at perhaps not even at a systemic level, but at a cellular level even. And we've come a long way. I mean, the, the advancements of antibiotics has been a massive boon to extend uh, lifespan uh, for human beings over the last five to six decades. But I think the challenge is also part of the uh, part of the structure wherein we currently operate in a model which is very siloed it is very much focused on pathogenesis and sick care 
And that is not necessarily the way we live our lives or the health and well-being as we would like to enjoy it from that perspective should occur. I mean, the lovely metaphor of the seven blind people feeling different parts of the elephants is exactly what happens inside of a hospital institution. If you have chest pain and you see a respiratory physician versus a gastroenterologist versus a cardiologist, the differential diagnosis will be different between those different individuals, therefore. So I think for us, there are two things that we need to try and solve on, perhaps a third subtlety. The first is ensuring that we're creating a future which is increasingly integrated with one another, and we no longer practice purely in verticals and silos. The second aspect is to ensure that we are focused as much on the improvement of our trajectory of health rather than only focus on the sick care and the pathogenesis of that, because there is an opportunity for betterment for everyone. And the last thing I'll touch upon, and perhaps this is a topic that we'll go into more detail later on, is really the role of data, wherein in the last few weeks alone, each of us have been exposed to a UI interface of artificial intelligence and the amount of data that each of us are creating, how can we use that to the betterment of the people who we look after and the care that we provide? All right, excellent. Yeah, thank you for those insights. The future of healthcare is going to move away from just being focused on sickness and illness uh, to, you know, to the ability to thrive and to live life fully. Yeah, lovely. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, I have a question for you, Taranjit, you know, and you have been exposed to this whole debate of, uh, you know, the biomedical model. And, but in this, the, in this debate, you know, how important is it for us to make a distinction between communicable and non-communicable diseases, you know, say between diabetes and COVID? Yeah. How important is it for us to make this distinction, you know, when we are evaluating the biomedical model? So when we are evaluating biomedical model, there's another model uh, which we are not taught in our medical schools is biopsychosocial model, where we take an individual uh, patient as part of psychology, biology, and society slash culture. And I think that is a more relevant model when we are trying to treat patients at an individual level for chronic conditions. Um, that is where the answer to your question lies. That for chronic conditions, um, particularly in, you know, the ones which we are diagnosed at the earlier stage in life and go on to the rest of your life, biopsychosocial model um, is much more relevant and effective. But when it comes to communicable conditions and diseases like infections and these epidemics or pandemics that we are seeing, that's right. where data as well as uh, biomedical models can come handy. But even in that data, and uh, like for example, my thought was always, of course, we lost a lot of lives in COVID, but then there were so many people who survived COVID. So my question was, why did the ones who survived, why did they survive? what was playing in, in their lives, which helped them to survive COVID, and what was going on in lives of other people who just went in a section. So that was a very interesting, uh, I mean, I never had this course to go to um, and, you know, research into that area. But my guess is that stress played an important role. And there again, I think biopsychosocial model becomes uh, relevant. So overall, biomedical model is highly restrictive and very, very limited in its approach. And it does not have answers to all the predicaments of human existence. All right. But, you know, you brought up this point about stress, which is was really going to be my next. So, sorry, Vandana has uh, has raised her hand. So, Vandana, you want to add something to what Tarantino? Yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, we always talk from the medical point of view. And we never talk, uh, think of emotions because... There may be unprocessed emotion that a person is uh, going through, and because of which, you know, the, there is a lot of toxic, uh, you know, inside which happens to a person. So I think uh, while dealing with anything, we need to talk about emotions, and we also need to, you know, bring that into uh, a lot of importance. Because if we are able to talk about the emotions, if we are able to communicate well then we will be able to process a lot of things and maybe get answers to what Taranjit was saying. And why did some people survive and some people did not survive? I think we focus a lot on the data nowadays, but we forget the many of the uh, you know, like uncomplicated things 
uh, which can help a patient or a caregiver or an individual. Right, right, right. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you, Vandana, for adding to that. Uh, you know, so whilst we are on this topic of stress, uh, maybe if I could just reframe the question that uh, Taranji posed, and it's a question really for all three of you on, uh, you know, on the panel today. Uh, in gen generally speaking, what is the role of stress in, in, in an illness? And why is it that, you know, in some cases, it manifests itself as, you know, as a heart attack. In some cases, it manifests itself as high blood pressure, or, you know, in some cases, it can even contribute to cancer. Yeah. Any any insights on this? And what do you feel uh, about the role of stress? Marcus and Taranjit? Yeah. Um, the stress is a physiological response. And I think it's really important that we allow it to not receive the bad name that it gets too often. Uh, when we talk about it, and the question that you were asking, Shakti, was implying the bad stress, the chronic stress, or what we call distress. There is a good form of stress that's called eustress, E-U-S-T-R-E-S-S, -E -S, which is basically the fight and flight mechanism, which is critical to survive, right? Chase down the deer or run away from the lion, without which we wouldn't have been evolved to where we are today. Um, so what we're really talking about when society uses the word stress as a balance is this idea of chronic stress or, or negative or bad stress. And there is clearly a, a body brain implication to this. There is activation of the amygdala. There is a firing of sequences which happen over a prolonged period of time, elevates. It starts with adrenaline, but then it starts to then extend towards cortisol. And cortisol leads to this widespread, chronic, prolonged inflammatory state that has various effects in different bodily systems. It can lead to inflammation in the coronary vasculature, which then promotes the atherosclerosis that we see. It can cause changes in our metabolic health, leading to insulin resistance, and therefore the pathways around sort of metabolic syndrome and diabetes, et cetera. And then through a variety of other mechanisms, it can also potentially lead to some of the other lifestyle-related non-communicable diseases that you did mention. And I really like this fact that uh, Mandana mentioned before uh, and Dr. Taranjit, which is the interplay between the body and mind and just how critical it is, because there is so much science that now suggests that if you are able to deal and, 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 and manage the emotional state of an individual, there are profound physical alterations and changes that they have, that they see, not just in terms of their phenotype, but even at the sort of expression of particular genes and the transcription of certain genes that leads to that effect as well. So I think it's a really, really fascinating area. And the more we understand this link between psychology and physiology, the better all of us will become at dealing with these chronic uh, non-communicable diseases as well. Right, thank you, thank you, thank you, Marcus. Uh, so uh, Taranjit, you were just speaking about the psycho, biopsychosocial model, right? And where does the where does this whole thing about stress fit into this model? And how does how do you how does and what's been your experience? How do you deal with patient stress? So um, the biopsychosocial model has a very um, um, significant physiological um, you know you can clinically show it the HPA axis which. Uh, Marcus was talking about is biopsychosocial. Now, uh, the hypothalamus or the amygdala and then put pituitary and then adrenaline and then you have all this cortisol which is there for a long time having an impact on almost every part of the body. It is very clear biopsychosocially uh, we are all connected, you know. Now, coming to the stress, uh, you stress and the distress which uh, Marcus said, um, I think the stress which we, we are all talking about is the allostatic load that we are all taking. I'm sure Marcus is aware of this term. Uh, the, the, constant, uh, the constant feedbacks which are coming from our environment on our emotional and psychological system. And uh, most of it is negative. Most of the suggestions or thoughts which are impregnated into our minds through newspapers or other media, it's really causing a lot of distress in our minds and uh, without realizing, because everything that's happening in your brain and mind is invisible, intangible, unlike diabetes, which you can see in the numbers and you know other things which ever go fluctuate and you see the numbers. But when things happen in your brain, nothing it's totally invisible and intangible. And we continue to take that. And we continue to you know uh, keep accepting that. 
you may have a friend who is extremely negative but she's your best friend and now every time you meet her and she's always talking about something that went wrong in her life you know you have no idea what it is causing to your own mind and you and you have your things going on in you so these things are very you know they're just happening around like life circumstances but we don't realize what it is causing to our body and somewhere we continue to expose ourselves to all this we we are we are talking about pollution air pollution but there's a lot of psychological pollution psychic pollution which is happening around and we are totally uh, oblivious to it and <laughs> exposing ourselves to it and i think that's why we should take a complete account of that in our life now it's high time we do that otherwise uh, doctors are there <laughs> to treat you <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So I'm I'm going to you know just move on to you know this uh, shift the discussion to well being because uh, we've we've dwelt on illness we uh, we understand that but even in all the conversations I've heard from all three of you there's been a significant talk about you know by the by the body mind connection so I want to dwell on this uh, you know a little more. you know so when we talk about the paradigm of well being it is uh, it is we are talking about you know an appraisal of one's emotional state and it can be understood as the presence of you know positive emotions or the absence of uh, negative emotions and uh, the world health organization defines this as a positive state experienced by individuals and societies but well being we may not be able to treat ourselves medically but uh, each one of us as lay individuals the our, the well being is very much in you know in our hands so i'm going to begin with you uh, marcus this is uh, you know during covid and i remember you speaking about this quite recently you contracted covid you know during your frontline duty and you know after your bout of covid you felt overwhelmed overwhelmingly you felt a need to focus on your well-being yeah and you even ended up i think you still are doing that practicing fasting for like 72 hours at a time why have you been doing this uh, is it related to this new buzzword that one keeps hearing about autophagy and what are its advantages can you can you tell us a little more about about this i think um the shared common experience that we've all had over the last few years and i was watching the new episode the new um season of new amsterdam hospital on netflix last night and it starts off with of course the pandemic journey we've all gone through a lot of pain so i think my story is just one of many millions of stories around the world that have had pain and and endured and in that pain as vandana was suggesting illness opens your mind to certain aspects and perspectives of life and what you really want to do and how you want to live your life therefore and in that sort of psychological and physical uh, challenges and pains that i faced i was ex- i mean i did have access to uh, steroids and all the things that we thought were useful at that period in time but i wanted to make sure that i'm giving myself the best fighting chance and that's where i started to practice what i preached for many many years which is this idea of biohacking myself and i told myself i remember very clearly it was my birthday and my mom brought this birthday cake over for me and as i was blowing out the candles i was thinking what do i what do i wish for and i told my brain the story that it's not often that a runner gets to learn how to run again and that was the motivation that then started this journey of of repair and recovery and rehab for me and as i went down that journey for myself there were so many aspects that i started to rediscover and now i condense it down to what i call the five pillars the first being the importance of sleep and how important that is from a recovery and a repair perspective and how you can actually biohack sleep in so many ways the second was around fueling the body and that's where intermittent fasting or time restricted eating and uh, we can talk a little bit about that as well had such a powerful role to play as well as macronutrients micronutrients supplementation hydration all those things the third was the, the the importance of movement and exercise in your life the fourth was the environment which is people places and technologies and the fifth as vandana was sharing earlier is your emotional state because it's critical to that um to that uh, uh, framework of well being 
So these are the five pillars that I like to look at when it comes to the practice of well-being. Now, you know, I'm sure a lot of our viewers are interested in intermittent fasting and I could talk for hours on it and I'm not going to do that. But basically this idea of stress, hormetic stress, creating the opportunity for your body to undergo a small amount of good stress leads to a beneficial gain in the long term. And when you restrict calories in the body, the cells undergo a process of replenishment and cleansing and identification of faulty structures that need to be repaired. And it uses that in a process to then build something new. And that's autophagy, auto self-phagy eating. So the cells begin to eat itself, identify structures which are no longer useful, and then transform that or recycle that into new material. And the time that you spend in these different phases of time-restricted eating has many different effects. And yes, I do like to spend at least three days every six months in a water only fasted state. And I've, I've individually seen great benefits and I've certainly seen benefits in the people who I care for as well. Wow, that's, that's remarkable. Yes, yeah, so what I understand is that autophagy just helps in removing the toxins of the body and uh, that is a big contributor to positive health. Yeah, th thank you, Marcus. This is very, very inspiring to hear, you know, the five pillars pillars that you just enumerated. Uh, Taranji, the, you know, you introduced this whole thing about the bio uh, psychosocial model. Can you elaborate a little more on this, uh, on the body-mind connection and give us examples of how you apply this in your, in your, in your work and maybe in your own life? Can you, can you dwell on this a little more? So I'll, I'll start with an example, which is a story of a patient that I will share with you all. Yes. Um, Quite some time back when I was working with my mentor in Bangalore, I, uh, there was a patient who was admitted in our ward with an infection of the facial space, okay, on the face somewhere, uh, there was an infection and the clinical cause of the infection was a tooth. Now, in spite of removing the tooth and doing everything possible uh, that we do, you know, uh, under the biomedical um, per view that, you know, you remove the tooth, you do this, you do that, and uh, you give high uh, you know, intravenous antibiotics, you admit the patient, you do everything, and it should resolve in at least minimum five to seven days. Any infection, which is mild to moderate, should resolve in this situation. And, and clinically, it, the patient appeared very healthy, and there was no reason why the infection should not have resolved. But uh, they did everything, she was kept under highest antibiotics, culture sensitivity, everything is done. But the past continued to pour and pour. And it's the 10th day and still we could see the past, which is still pouring from her temporal space, as we call it. And that's when, in one of the ward rounds, when I started talking to her and just started discussing. And there used to be this small girl and we were all under the impression that this, this girl is her daughter. And then she started sharing her history with me and then that's when she she shared the history personal history and uh, realized that the daughter is not hers but her sister who is also married to her husband she was sharing a husband with her sister and that and we were all living in a very close proximity and there was a lot of emotional trauma and psychological trauma the woman was under highly educated people from uh, southern part of the world and going through this situation. And when she discussed all that out, and as Vandana Ji was saying, you know, it's suppression of emotion is the biggest, biggest problem that we can create for our body. When we suppress our emotions, when we don't talk about them, you know, when we hide them, and, and, and that converts into a disease. And when, when she started talking about it, and of course she did not reveal it to many people, so I couldn't uh, I couldn't uh, tell this to my mentor what she was sharing with me. But then she shared everything that she had in her mind, and her she was keeping it on hidden. And after that, she started the company. So this is how biopsychosocial, you know, I mean, uh, an infection and a tooth, and these are very obvious, visible reasons, and we treated them. Yet the patient was untreatable until she shared her personal story and she started healing herself. So as physicians and as doctors, uh, Vandana Ji was saying that we can only uh, we can only give you medication. 
but i would go a step further as doctors we actually can remove the barrier which are created by you and your mind and your emotions we can help you remove those barriers and then you yourself heal as a patient you know you yourself heal and body has immense capacity to heal we have seen that uh, through our training and through our experience so as physicians uh, not much of intervention is needed you just need uh, uh, listening ha uh, listening uh, ears and eyes which see what is not shown i think that that, that should be all but some of you lost that art of listening you lost the art of <laughs> So that is a very interesting insight that you've just shared. And I'm going to try and come back to you on this, uh, Taranjit, what is and what should be the role of the doctors in terms of their outlook or their approach. Uh, but I have a question for Vandana before we move to, you know, the larger canvas of holistic health and healthcare. Uh, you know, Vandana, you run VK Foundation and, you know, God knows how many hundreds and thousands of uh, patients that you have, uh, your, your foundation has helped. Now, how far do you think chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery go in the recovery of a patient? What is it that you at VK Foundation do to support the recovery of patients? I know you support them financially, you support them materially, but there's other stuff that you're also doing. So what else do you do to support the recovery of patients? Can you just tell us a little more? Yeah, so before I talk about that, can I talk about markers and the fasting? Because yes, yes. Uh, we went through the process of fasting. And according to me, fasting is not uh, a restriction on yourself. It is more to, you know, regain, genuinate your body and uh, to, for renewal. This idea is that the body should get some space and they should be able to renew their cells and they should be able to think and all that. And that is how fasting will become more important rather than uh, you know, just uh, um, uh, thinking of it as a restriction. Uh, I, I hope Marcus agrees with me because it is a rest for the body and the mind and the spirit altogether. Uh, again, before I go to uh, chemotherapy, etc., I want to say that, you know, I, what I would always tell the patients is that uh, suffering is equal to pain into resistance. So the more you try to resist it, the more pain you are going to get. And pain is inevitable. When you are having chemotherapy or radiation or you go through surgery, there is going to be some sort of a pain. But uh, suffering is not uh, necessary. Now you have to decide how you want to reclaim your joy. How do you want to decrease your su uh, suffering? And uh, if you're feeling tired and overwhelmed, then balance your hormones and digestion. I think it is very important that you take care of the digestive part of it and also take care of your nervous system. How you can look out for uh, burnout, ways of uh, finding ways to burn out and fatigue. I know during my own chemotherapy, uh, I, there were times when you, know, you felt very low and I had started painting, fabric painting, and I had started doing embroidery. And that was a way of getting, you know, getting my mind off my treatment, off my, um, you know, whatever I was doing, uh, whatever I was suffering. And I think that is what we need to understand. And, uh, you know, when you're overwhelmed and you're anxious and stressed, it becomes hard to calm down. So ideally, we should uh, identify the symptoms in, and then work on its qualities, you know, how to, uh, you know, how to not suffer that, how to find ways of not suffering that. And maybe, you know, sometimes what happens is that the patient has issues because of chemotherapy and radiation and all those things. But they are a little, um, uh, you know, like they won't talk openly about it to the doctor. And the doctor does not know that they are going through something like that. So we encourage the patients to talk to the patient. We want to empower them so that, you know, they're not scared to talk to the doctors and to ask the doctors openly what they want to, in the symptoms that they have. Because there are some symptoms which are of the mind which you can look after yourself, but there are certain symptoms which are not of your mind, which are doctor related, and you need to talk to the doctor about it. So it's a combination. Here I just want to mention something else. You know, uh, I had shingles in March, and uh, now it's almost three months, and I I didn't know much about shingles at all. But uh, I realized that the pain that I was going through and the numbness and everything that came with shingles has been extremely, extremely, uh, you know, it's worked out my mind so much that I feel uh, life is not worth living because, and I never felt that with the cancer, you know. 
And I, uh, I don't know how much the doctor tells a patient because in my case, I feel that the doctor had not informed me enough. And also, you know, uh, if the side effects are carrying on for long, then there has to be ways of uh, looking after those side effects. I understand the nerves are damaged. Explain that to the patient. That's important. So uh, my shingles has been three months and my cancer treatment was six months. So you can imagine how I feel that uh, my cancer was better than shingles, I think, in that case, you know. So it's how you treat the, the patient, how you talk to the patient what you explain to the patient. And that is why, you know, when patients who have chemotherapy, radiation, or um, surgery, we like to talk to them. We like to find opportunities to talk to them and tell them not about the treatment, but tell them about how to cope with it. Like, you know, if somebody is getting swelling in their arms and you put some cabbage leaves, it's just simple things, you know, something doable. So that is how we've been able to help our patients uh, under the process of treatment. I can go on, but I know there's a restriction on time. So, yeah. uh, th th thank you, Vandana. I think you've uh, hit upon a very important point, which is, uh, you know, the way in which doctor are doctors really treating an illness, or are they treating the patient? And there's a distinction between the patient and the and the illness. And I think you're also doing work in patient advocacy. It's important to, you know, manage the doctor-patient relationship, but we're not going to have the time to get into all of these subtleties today. But I have another question for you, uh, Vandana, and that is, you know, today a, a, a treatment like, you know, treatment for cancer care is prohibitively expensive. And uh, the, the cost of administering this healthcare, you cannot not be cut down you know, substantially if there is a proactive movement towards uh, screening. Because if you, you're picking up something, you, there's a greater chance of nipping, nipping it in the bud, you, you know, and uh, cost-wise, it becomes more effective. But still we see, you know, even three days ago, the ICSA Foundation has contributed a thousand crores of rupees to set up new cancer hospitals, but I don't hear anybody talking about, uh, you know, investing in screening. And uh, so why why is it that this is the norm today? And what can be done to shift the needle towards uh, early detection? So screening is something which is, you know, which has not been effective according to me, because not many people have come forward to be screened. Not many people want to know that they have cancer, even if it is, you know, they haven't understood that in the early uh, stages, the cancer is curable. For them, cancer still carries some stigma. Like uh, there are so many stigmas attached to cancer and they don't want to know about uh, cancer at all. You won't believe that when we had, uh, you know, there were health exhibitions and we used to put up stalls uh, in those exhibitions, the people would end up pick up the information sheets that we have and before they could talk to us and they realized it was about cancer, they would drop it like a hard brick. So they did not want to know about screening. But I think what we need to do is um, make screening easy for people and also tell them that even if one person is found to have cancer, that person will be treated completely by the people who are doing the screening. I think if you come to know that you have cancer and then there is no further treatment or no further help towards treatment by the agencies, then the patient doesn't want to know. I mean, the per person doesn't want to know that he's got cancer. So I think that is what the reason screening has not picked up the way it should. Also, you know, we should focus on only those cancers which are more prevalent in our country, like the head and neck cancers or the, you know, breast cancers or the cervical cancer and, and the regions where they are popular, uh, more uh, prevalent. Like uh, cervical cancer is more in the villages and breast cancer is more in the urban areas. So I think there has to be a study to see what we are focusing on. And there's no need to, you know, often what I find that uh, we are teaching the educated. So people who already know about it are, are not interested and we are wasting our time and effort in trying to teach them. So we need to go out into a larger community and talk about it and uh, see how we can help out the community about that with, the, with enough resources to say that we are going to treat the patient who has been detected with cancer. I think only then screening will pick up. That's my view on screening. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Vandana, and, and good luck with that. Uh, I hope this movement spreads and, uh, you know, we are able to, you know, educate and, and, and make people more, more aware about uh, 
you know, prevention and early detection. It can make such a difference. Uh, I'm going to move to you, Taranjit. There's a big buzz around this, this word called, which we keep hearing about, you know, called epigenetics. And can you tell us what epigenetics is? And is there a body-mind connection somewhere built in epigenetics? So before I go to your question, I want to comment a little on what Vandalanji was saying about uh, prevention. There is a stigma, I think so, but I think if we can make our patients realize the importance of early detection, because in oral cancers, it is very easy to detect uh, um, the cancer at a very early stage. So if you can, if you, because, and if it is detected at a later stage, the growth effect and the complete effect on quality of life, post procedure and post treatment is humongous. The reason why uh, other cancers are not um, so popular in early detection is mainly because they are very difficult to detect also at an early stage. Um, except cervical cancer and oral cancers, which we can detect at an early stage because the examination is very easy and non-invasive. Um, in uh, and, and you don't have to spend anything. In fact, self-examination is also possible in oral cancer, um, early detection. Uh, in our situation, it is definitely becoming very popular amongst our patients because we are educating our uh, patients about the risk factors and uh, who are prone and who are not. And through that, and we are also educating general dental surgeons uh, uh, about uh, how to do a prosthetic screening. So it is definitely picking up. The trend is definitely picking up. Um, but yes, overall prevention and early detection in cancer should be the way so that all these humongous costs that we are paying for cancer care can be avoided by the state or by the persons themselves. And uh, we all know that going to cancer care is not uh, a very pleasant experience for anyone. You know, even whether you can afford or you cannot afford, going through that experience, even on the treatment and cancer care is not uh, something that anybody would want to do. So why not choose prevention? And if, if as physicians, we can uh, put this forward for our patients, I'm, I'm sure they should be able to choose prevention and other direction as their mode of, uh, you know, care. Yeah. Now, coming to your question. Uh, just, I think just before that, uh, Taranjit, uh, I think Vandana has yeah. raised a hand. Is this in relation to what uh, Taranjit yeah. just said, Vandana? Okay. This is about the screening part of it that we're talking about. You know, what happens is uh, we make a lot of films which are shown in the picture halls about uh, cancer and you know how uh, people have oral cancer and we so, uh, show ghastly images which are not even seen by the audience because most of them walk out during that time. Uh, if we, we want to focus on early detection, then what I think what we can do is make films where we say that you know, this person was uh, went in for early detection and he was cured and nothing happened to him. And this way, person, delayed his treatment and this is what happened to him. So you see the uh, you know, comparison between the two and that may probably motivate people that, you know, or we can there you know, like we have so much data. People who have got gone in for early detection, X number of patients were treated completely. People who got late, X number only could be treated. Those type of things, you know, on a film, on a screen, will make more, uh, I think, impact than showing just ghastly images. All right. Uh, thank you. So, uh, hmm. yeah. so Shakti ji, uh, yes. as far as epigenetics is concerned, uh, yes. my uh, my uh, knowledge about epigenetics is very metaphorical. I cannot claim to be having a lot of knowledge about it, but I can surely say for whatever I have read till now, different jobs work and other ones, that uh, the predisposition to disease is not equivalent to predetermination. It does not mean that just because you are predisposed to a certain disease condition like your parents or your grandparents were, uh, were diabetics, so you are also prone to diabetes. Uh, so this is what I mean when I say that predisposition does not mean predetermination. It does not mean that you will also have diabetes. So just, uh, you know, some, there's some illness which is going on in your family, so it has to come to you. It is not mandatory. Uh, okay. So this is where the role of epigenetics comes into picture that uh, the, the environment in which your genes are filling in, I think that is the environment that we still have a control over. And that environment is actually created by cognition. Uh, I think one of the 
one of the attendees is very smart enough to pick up all these uh, uh, points very quickly all right uh, and, and she has very important point is the cognition the body the the thoughts and the emotion is which the environment uh, they are the ones which are creating environment for a body uh, the cells in our body and the dna and how they are replicating the telomeres as we keep talking about so epigenes epigenes is definitely taking uh, taking over uh, genes you know and the whole uh, whole human genome project which was considered to be very promising in the beginning and lot of uh, millions and millions of dollars are spent on it hasn't really got much out of that that is what my uh, last reading suggests i recommend everybody bit of normal by gabor mate is one of the very interesting book which will discuss all this in problem with us i hope this satisfies yeah, yeah. yeah. all right yeah thank thank you thank you taranjit uh, i have uh, one final question that's for marcus and then we'll open it up uh, there's i see a couple of questions in the q and a as well as the chat uh, so marcus you've also been you know very passionate about planetary health and so what is the interrelationship between environmental health and and public health uh, and should doctors be limit an associated question should doctors be limiting themselves to the in treatment of individual patients or should they be enhancing their purview uh, to a patient's social and natural environment as organisms we've evolved over many hundreds of thousands of generations to adapt to the physical environment that we're placed in uh 9.8 meters per second gravitational load uh, a particular concentration of 21% oxygen in the air a light level luminescence a radiation level through the ozone etc cetera, etc cetera. these are not things that just are there in coincidence we are here because of the way we have responded to reacted and evolved to deal with those stresses and therefore the environment around us is one of the most central tenets to our health and longevity uh, the climate crisis is a public health emergency it's something that i have been talking about for almost 10 years it was a subject of a white paper that i wrote and i presented at the annual leaders summit in davos in 2016 um and the whole idea was that a lot of changes that are happening to the physical world around us are directly going to contribute towards massive degrees of health emergencies in the years to come and by the way number 3 of my risk identification on that paper that i submitted and presented was the impending likelihood of a of a pandemic a virally associated pandemic and then 2020 showed us exactly what happened there so i think this is something we have to take big notice of we are seeing a acute rise in respiratory disorders in cardiovascular conditions purely because of the pm 2.5 particulate matter in the air we are seeing significant uh, increases in heat stroke kidney diseases and cardiovascular conditions because of rising temperature and dehydrations a lot of the conflicts that we're seeing around the world today whether it's syria or yemen Or, or whether it's across the Middle East, other parts of Africa, and the civil wars are all directly because of natural uh, resource shortages, principally water. And I remember—I can't remember who it was that said it, but someone said that the Third World War would be fought uh, on water as the as the main as the main uh, sort of commodity and resource. So these are big challenges that we need to face, and it's not something that we can continue pushing under the carpet. because the pandemic was just the first shot over the bow and we've now got an opportunity to collectively come together as a species and create the right mitigation strategies because if we're not careful it's going to run away and become overwhelming to us all right thank you thank you very much uh, marcus i'd love to continue this conversation but we're going to be running out of time so i'm just going to move over to audience question and answers and the first one is a question from bhavna if uh, you know and and it's a question on okay it's uh, what do you understand as health and what do you consider as holistic can i can i request that you for this particular question that you type the answers uh, all of you as as panelists uh, what do you cons what do you consider what do you understand as health and what do you consider as uh, holistic and this would just help uh, help us move uh, you know faster because there i think a whole lot of questions in in um in the in the chat so if i could just 
uh, move to the questions in the chat. And this is a question from Victor Wegner. And this is a question, he doesn't say who it is directed to. So any one of you would like to, uh, you know, uh, answer this, feel free to. His question is, how can you convince a person who suffers from stress but denies this fully? Does he or she have to go really, does he or she have to really feel the physical consequences before he or she admits of, of, of this? Or is there a way to help this person? I know someone who suffers now from severe metastatic pancreatic cancer, and I feel that severe stress is the cause. So anybody who'd like to you know, answer this question? Taranji, Vandana? Yeah. I mean, I personally believe that disease is, uh, illness is basically trying to, um, body speaks, uh, body speaks through illnesses. And if there is an illness, then definitely it is trying to indicate something that's uh, going wrong in, in um, the realm of psychology and emotions for sure, including cancer. In fact, I have, I have some research which even backs that even things which look like fractures, you know, which are seen as accidents, uh, even that is something that body is trying to teach us something or tell us things through our accidents. You know, some people are more accident prone than the others. And accident being the name accident, you feel that it's just a random thing that has happened, but uh, no, it is not random. Now, uh, not diverting from that, yes, your your friend or your family member, whoever is going through this, has to be encouraged to uh, discuss the emotional aspect, not related to the disease, but in general, the, mm -hmm. because there are some uh, research also back to about cancer-prone personalities. There are some people who are prone to cancer, people who are very submissive, who don't express, who don't uh, express their, uh, you know, uh, if they are upset about something or if they don't agree with a certain point of view and they're very submissive, they don't express their no very easily. They are the ones who are prone to chronic diseases and even uh, cancer, some of the cancers. So maybe a, a, a session with a therapist or going through psychotherapeutic sessions or hypnotherapy sessions also. Um, now there was some question on psychedelics, you know. So these are the new modes through which your mind, body, emotion can open up and can, it's a different avenue through which healing can happen besides medications. Medications can be very supportive in such a situation, but yes, they should use other avenues as well. Talking to a good friend or journaling, you know. Psychosomatic conditions can easily be handled through journaling, through therapy. And we have begun to see that almost all illnesses are psychosomatic. So you are in favor of psychedelics for holistic healing, uh, Taranjeet? I am. I, yeah. am. I yeah. don't have a personal experience, but I'm certainly in favor of psychedelics for holistic healing. All right. I think that it's very promising. Yeah. I think the state of Oregon in the U.S. has just legalized one of the... Uh, the drugs that is used for, um, you know, for psychedelic healing. Yeah. Anyone else has the... I think Chile has been an MDMA known to have okay. yeah. yeah. Marcus, do you have a view on this, on on psychedelics? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very excited by the emerging literature. I know King's College London, uh, two years ago, uh, started publishing work around different forms of psychedelic mushrooms and the effects of depression and very significant, powerful, beneficial effects. Um, some of the uh, molecules like the MDA and MDMA analogs are being used for PTSD and severe uh, post-traumatic stress disorders um, as yeah. well. And uh, I think even at the other end of the spectrum, when we look at some of the CBD oils and the essential oils and the use of cannabinoids for states of relaxation, for improvement of appetite, for uh, bringing some more vitality to life, particularly people who are at the latter stages of an advanced disease. Uh, I think there's some very, very strong evidence to suggest that um, this has got a role to play. It requires a strong legal framework and the right prescription methodology so that it doesn't cause more damage than good. But uh, I hope that we can uh, come around those and can actually make these available for people across the world. Right. Set and setting, as they say about psychedelics, set and setting. 
you need mm. a proper set setting and mindset and that is the stuff fantastic i think that's the way to be that's where we are all moving to very fast all right there, there are there's one more question from uh, victor but uh, just before that can we maybe just go back to bhavana's original question on what does each one of you understand as health and what do you consider as holistic uh, can i say something on this yes yes please uh, uh, not being a doctor for me health is uh, more in the mind and more about thinking and more about uh, you know your own well being the type of food that you are eating the type of emotions that you are carrying on the type of uh, i mean i know you need to go to a doctor but at the same time more than 50% is your in your own hands you need to be looking after yourself and i think all of us uh, can understand the emotion that we are going through and uh, all of us uh, know how to deal with these emotions So I think we need to prioritize which one is the strongest thing which is bothering you, and why it is bothering you, and then work on it, and then the next and the next and the next. So that is where you know people like us who are there to listen make a lot of uh, can make a lot of difference because you know we are only listening to somebody saying what they want to say, and most times you know they don't get that opportunity because if they go to the doctor the first thing is you will be all right but listen to me why don't you listen to me why don't you look up to me all those things are important so my views are totally different from what the doctors are saying because it's from a layman's uh, point of view also i deal more with the patients who are not in the very high class of uh, you know uh, uh, economic strata so maybe it's difficult for them to even think of going to another doctor and adding on and to say that you know we already have cancer and now we have to go to a psychiatrist or something like that so that adds on to their uh, difficulties both in terms of medical cost and other so we try to help them in finding solutions themselves and you have know, uh, identifying their emotions and i think it has helped in a very big way because whenever we have spoken to a patient who has been troubled it's not that we haven't seen patients who are troubled but uh, it has taken a lot of time you know talking to them talking to the spouse or talking to the family members and all that for each patient but ultimately you know they've been able to say what is bothering them and that makes a lot of difference i mean i can narrate many such incidents which i have gone through with with the patient and uh, today they are all friends you know like they are all friends who can uh, who can uh, tell me things even today so that is the main thing you know that you've gone through your treatment you uh, unburden yourself and you uh, you know like become better and then you still treat me as a friend and that is the important part hey marcus and uh, taranji do you have a perspective do you want to share anything on this i uh, being a healthcare professional my uh, my journey started with the interpretation of health as something that i would see more as a bodily health then it included uh, mind as well Okay, and now when I am at uh, the fourth decade of my life, approaching fifth, I would say that I have also added the element of uh, spiritual aspect. Okay, so for me, I think not just for myself, but for uh, anybody who approaches me for care, uh, health is 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 not just body. You go to the gym, you you do some yoga, and you feel that you don't have any illness, so you're fine. but what is your experience of life what is your experience of life living how do you approach your life everyday life you know and if your approach if you wake up every day in the morning and you you are enthusiastic about your life your day i think in that case you are healthy in that case even if you don't have a limb or you have you you have a single kidney you are still healthy but in case if every day in the morning when you wake up and you lack meaning you are emotionally distressed you don't know what to do with yourself you are addicted to your phones or you are addicted to something else you are not healthy even if everything if all the body parts are working okay so for me i think health has now become very very holistic how i how what are the relationships that i'm enjoying you know how is my relationship with my family members with my friends with my community what is my relationship with the higher power if i believe in one okay that is spiritual aspect and how you know how i take care the five pillars of health which marcus talked about 
those are the five pillars including the other pillars which are accessory pillars in my case yeah but i think uh, um health means to me and that is what i try to explain to my patients or people who approach me all right thank you wonderful the last word for you marcus and then we will close this webinar health is relative um health is transient and health is evolving uh, so as tarjit is saying it's something that we each define for ourselves number one it's transient because um, we dip in out in and out of health uh, because there are other things that go on in our naturally busy day to day lives and it's not always the biggest priority for us and so at times it can be at the bottom but at times we want it to be at the top so we understand the transient nature of dipping in and out of health and the priorities that lead to that and the last thing it's evolving because we will never be in a state of perfect health however we define it it's always going to be something that we strive towards and will constantly be uh, 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 not reachable uh, from that perspective so we need to appreciate that the health that we had when we were in our 20s is very different to the health that we enjoy when we are in our 40s and 50s and what we can hope to enjoy in our 70s and 80s as well so i i really look at it and that's why i wrote in the comment as well that health is just being in a state of our best self possible right how are we to find that for yourself excellent yeah thank you very much uh, Ma marcus daranjit and vandana for a very engaging conversation we have uh, many comments in the in the chat but for all of those who are still on the call uh, you will get a copy of not a link to not only the recording but also somebody mentioned whether you know would they get a copy of the transcript yes you will get a copy of a link to the copy of the transcript as well as the chat yeah so on behalf of shaktify i want to thank all of you very much uh, you know our panelists and our uh, audience uh, you know for taking the time out to be a part of this conversation i hope you found it you know insightful and useful and uh, you know do stay in touch and keep a lookout for the next set of webinars that we will be announcing soon yeah thank you very much thank you